started. We have a bit of competition, but we can outshine over in the Australia Pavilion. No pun intended. Welcome everybody um, to this, I think the last session of today, the last panel session of today. It's going to be very exciting, and I am glad that you have joined us. How many Australians do we have in the audience? Probably too many for this session because it is being run by Austrade, and so um, we were, you know, hoping it was going to be filled mostly with Japanese, Koreans, um, the Germans, um, and any other country that really needs us right now. Um, but you are also most welcome. I'd like to pay a special welcome to uh, the Australian delegation. I think we have got some youth ambassadors in the audience as well that have come here. Uh, representatives of our uh, First Nations peoples. Have we got any other countries that I haven't uh, also acknowledged here? Sweden, you are most welcome to. I think you are a renewable energy superpower in the making yourselves. What have we got in the back row here? Switzerland, excellent, welcome. Um, and I don't know if he has joined us, but I'd also like to specially acknowledge His Excellency Oman Sharaf, who is Assistant Minister of the UAE for Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation for Advanced Science and Technology, and I do believe the Project Manager or Program Manager for the UAE's first mission to Mars. I think that deserves a round of applause, because that's... <laughs> This is the sort of inspirational stuff that we need to do what we need to do over the course of the next three or four decades, folks, and as soon as possible. So thank you, Your Excellency. You are most welcome here. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am Anna Freeman. I am the Policy Director for Decarbonisation at the Clean Energy Council, and we are the peak body for the renewable energy sector in Australia, and uh, Austrade has bestowed on me the honour of hosting this afternoon's session. Um, Austrade is, of course, the agency which works to promote Australia's export industries and inbound investments and visitation to Australia. And it's an organisation that we, as the Clean Energy Council, have worked very closely with over the course of the last 10 or 15 years in advancing Australia's tremendous renewable energy potential. So it's, I'm really pleased to be able to host this session here today. We're going to be joined by some very distinguished speakers, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Well. Australia stands on the cusp of an extraordinary opportunity. It's an opportunity which, if we are successful, will be transformative not only for our own economy, but also could be highly consequential for global greenhouse gas emissions reduction efforts. Australia's vast renewable energy resources, the best combination of solar and wind resources in the developed world, combined with our formidable mineral resources, provides us with an historic opportunity to not only refashion our own economy and industries around low-cost clean energy, but also to help other markets do the same through green energy exports, through green renewable fuels like green ammonia and green methanol. And I, together with a number of colleagues, have just returned from the visit to the the green pioneer, green ammonia-powered ship sitting in the Dubai harbour at the moment. Has anyone else been out to see that over the course of the last few days? I think they're doing some visits this afternoon or later this evening, so very much encourage you to um, look at going to visit it. Um, I can give you the details after the session if you're interested. I think there shall also be some beer and wine served in case you're interested. Um, but that is a symbol 
of the things that there are to come. So Fortescue has developed its own demonstration green ammonia ship really to say this is something that we can make happen now. We can power shipping today with green fuels and here is a vessel that we have built in the course of the last year or two to prove it. So definitely worth a look. Other opportunities for Australia, green metals such as green iron and alumina. And of course, we also have heard a lot over recent years about the potential to potentially even directly supply um, other countries, other markets and regions through intercontinental connections and transmission. So there are large uh, solutions for decarbonisation and Australia can play a really big role. Not every country has access to it like Australia does and so I think we've got an important role but also a responsibility to use it for the benefit of the planet. So that's Australia's renewable energy superpower potential. It's a term coined around half a dozen years ago which is spurring a new wave of investment across Australia which is almost unparalleled in scale. I think we've got almost half or 40% or so of the uh, potential hydrogen projects, large-scale hydrogen projects in the world are slated for Australia. Well, today we are going to hear from some of those investors that are looking at the Australian market and investing in Australia today and, and over, over time. And we'll be discussing what it is that makes Australia a, um, a strong contender to be a globally significant player in value, green value-added uh, resources and, and energy. The policies that are preparing the way for that at the moment, there is a lot going on in Australia and some of the projects that are currently under development. So, before we begin with our panel discussion, I'm going to introduce to stage the pro Professor Frank Yotso, who if you were around about an hour ago, you will have um, heard speak in a session dedicated to hydrogen. Frank, an old colleague uh, and a real um, expert in Australia on all things energy transition uh, and trade and Frank um, will be speaking to us about the way that Australia can support uh, global decarbonisation efforts and the tremendous market opportunities that arise through that. Welcome Frank. Great, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have a big national dream, and that is to be the supplier of clean energy rather than carbon-intensive energy, uh, as, as this country, Australia, has been uh, for many decades. And uh, that dream uh, can, can become reality. Um, it can become rea reality. We have the geographic and other prerequisites uh, to fulfill that dream. Um, and the fundamental point to note here is that the global net zero transition will in all likelihood result in a very significant readjustment in the global geography of energy trade and in the global geography of energy intensive commodity trade. Okay? So we will in all likelihood see energy intensive production in geographies with high renewable energy potential uh, and of course also with high potential for carbon capture and sequestration and use. Um, and that enables then of course, as Anna pointed out, a, a significant share for Australia in that. So first of all, fundamentally we will see renewable energy displace fossil fuels. Um, we will see renewable energy largely produced near demand centers, right? So this is a fundamental difference between the new energy system and the old. Uh, you do have renewable energy potential pretty much everywhere. What difference is the extent of the potential uh, and the cost? We will also see renewable energy potential or renewable energy production transmitted over long distances. And that doesn't have to be through cables. That can be in molecular form uh, as well. You're thinking green molecules, you're thinking hydrogen, you're thinking hydrogen derivatives, ammonia, uh, also methanol, um, other, uh, other fuels, including all the way to synthetic fuels uh, that, that can be drop-in products for aviation uh, or other transport. Um, you're also thinking energy-intensive commodities produced on the basis of clean energy. Um, in Australia, we're thinking largely renewable energy, uh, wind and solar, as the energy input to that. 
um, and uh, you know, particular importance there could be uh, green iron, I'll come back to that. And of course there's minerals and metals processing using clean energy. A lot of uh, energy is in fact used in the mining operations and in the basic processing of mining products. And all of that of course means very large changes um, in trade as well as investment flows. Briefly on hydrogen, so you know, how big is that, that uh, you know, potential market in hydrogen in the world uh, energy system in future? So the IEA has estimates out there of between 3 to 6% of global energy supply by 2050 um, on the basis of hydrogen, all of it clean hydrogen, either blue hydrogen uh, or green hydrogen. Um, now, we should take those estimates literally, there's of course uh, a wide, you know, variation around what you might expect, the most likely central estimate, and we have a habit collectively of getting our central estimates wrong. So take this as, an, as a broad indication, but 3 to 6% of global energy demand is a very, very large number uh, indeed. On top of that, methanol, sustainable aviation fuels, sustainable shipping, shipping fuels, fertilizer, explosive, all of that. Now, Australia's advantage in that, I, I touched briefly on it, is, of course, high insulation, high wind speeds, large uh, land areas um, that are, it's not the case that they're not used, right? Uh, uh, First Nations people do use them, they're used for agriculture, but the opportunity cost, of course, of changing those land use is relatively low. Ready port access, uh, resource industry uh, expertise and experience, very important, open investment and trade framework, um, and relative uh, political stability, of course. Now, I touched on green iron and steel. Australia is the largest iron ore producer in the world. Australia is the largest iron ore exporter in the world as well. At the same time, steel production currently accounts for about 8% of global carbon dioxide emissions, 8% of global just for steel. Uh, so that absolutely needs to change in a net zero world. Now, how does that change? Well, first of all, we'll see an increase in the share of recycling in global steel production. Um, but primarily, we need to fundamentally revolutionize the way that primary steel is made. That's currently made using iron ore uh, and coking coal, metallurgical coal, uh, in, a, in a process that is as, a, as old as the ages. Um, it can be done using hydrogen, clean hydrogen, as the reductant, as the energy source to move from iron ore to, to iron. Um, and, uh, you know, the iron ore mining areas in the Pilbara are uh, really ideally positioned uh, for that because they're of course co-located uh, with enormous um, amounts of potential for wind and solar production, uh, really unlimited potential in, in practical terms. So what you do is split the process, right? You don't necessarily think of green steel production in Australia, you think of green iron production and then you think of shipping that iron to the steel mills of the world where the more high value added aspects of the process um, continue to take uh, place. None of this is, of course, uh, ready and easily done in practice. There's steel producers' preferences. Um, there's uh, further need for R&D and development in particular with regard to specific ore types, right? Um, so the hydrogen-based processes are to an extent still experimental and are uh, applicable to different extents to different ore types and of course immense capital needs if and when uh, that happens. Uh, it would also imply the early retirement of enormous amounts of blast furnace capacity, uh, much of it actually relatively young in China in particular, right? And you can see the myriad of difficulties that would sit around the early retirement uh, of tens of billions of dollars, potentially hundreds of billions of dollars um, of productive capa uh, capacity that is high carbon intensity, right? Just some of the challenges that await us collectively in that shift to net zero. Now, when we speak of the big national dream, right, it's potentially actually really very large, right? Now, as a thought experiment, and in a sense as a, as a, as a, as a limiting case, right? Imagine if we took all of Australia's current uh, energy production exports, yeah, most of it coal and gas, and then throw in all of uh, iron ore uh, and other minerals and metals produced, and imagine full processing of all of that in Australia, okay? So displacing current fossil fuel exports, plus processing all of these minerals and metals in Australia, then we'd be looking uh, at something like 
7,000 terawatt hours uh, of electricity um, of electricity equivalent use into hydrogen and into electricity for that processing in Australia, which is about 27 times current um, power generation and which is uh, about twice the total amount of solar and wind generation globally currently, right? Um, now, doing all of that would require the amount of land that you see here in blue, right? And so though these numbers are uh, kind of incredibly large, they could, in fact, be practically accommodated uh, in Australia. 2% of Australia's land mass you'd see under wind turbines and solar panels as a result of that. Um, if, you know, if we take that border, border case um, and uh, translate it into emission savings, then it amounts to about 11% of total greenhouse gas emissions in the Asia-Pacific region and 5% of global emissions saved uh, in that way. Now, finishing up on some more practical and near-term opportunities in the energy transition, and that is Australia as a supplier uh, of raw and processed materials that are needed in the energy transition, right? It's battery, me battery metals, uh, rare herbs, and so forth. And perhaps the standout, uh, standout commodity to look at here uh, is lithium. So uh, lithium exports are now worth about 20 billion Australian dollars per year. Uh, that's up from uh, really nearly nothing just a few years ago. Yes, granted, lithium prices have been really, really high. Uh, but at the same time as lithium prices are moderating, we're seeing an enormous expansion in capacity as well. And so expectations are... Um, that total revenue from lithium alone will actually keep increasing uh, over time. And that's, of course, before you look uh, at very many of the other commodities uh, that can be run, where processing can be run uh, on, on green power. So I hope that's a suitable introduction uh, for the panel discussion, and, and thanks very much again. Frank, just stay with me for a moment, because I'm just interested to ask you about what this all means for the global order. Um, obviously, our energy systems are well established globally as they are. Um, do, is this the start of a, a completely new phase of, of energy flows around the world? Yeah, I think, uh, look, in the interest of the world actually staying below two degrees temperature rise, we need to hope that it is the start because, you know, there is no world that is net zero emissions that does not see a fundamental rearranging of global energy and energy intensive flows, trade flows, right? Um, and so... Uh, we haven't seen much of that rearrangement yet at all, actually, you know, and when we're talking about the tens of billions of dollars that are ready to be invested in Australia in these kinds of industries, you know, the operative word here is ready to be invested. We haven't seen those investments in actual fact, and until we see those green investments anywhere in the world, we talk about Australia here, but this is the case, of course, also for Gulf states. It's the case for North America, for parts of Africa, um, South America as well. Um, until we see those productive capacities operating, uh, we won't see the rearrangement, realignment of trade flows. And when we see the realignment of trade flows, that will actually have quite significant economic and geopolitical ramifications as well. So um, strap in, uh, it'll be an interesting ride. Let's hope we see them soon. Thank you very much. Please thank Frank Yotso, Head of Energy at the ANU School of Climate. Um, I've got to get this right, Frank, because I didn't do it right before. Uh, Head of Energy at the ANU Institute of Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions at the ANU. Thanks very much, Frank. I might now invite our panellists to stage, if I would. Well, we'll start by Monique Miller, Chief Investment Officer at the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. Please take your seat below your photo. Rick de Buisserie, uh, CEO at Engie Australia in New Zealand. Anna Hancock, Executive Director at Pollination, a, a global uh, in, uh, climate change and advisory and investment um, group consultancy. And Sujit Paha, uh, Managing Director of Mazda Asia Pacific. Welcome, please welcome our panel. Well, I'm going to start with a question that you are completely unprepared for, but when you see those numbers that were on the screen just there from Frank, um, 7,000 terawatt hours of energy, uh, I think that's far beyond, I think he said what we currently have installed in the world today in renewables 
it's 27 times more um, than our current energy system in Australia. The numbers are mind-boggling. I'm going to go to Rick first as a, um, well, as a long-term energy investor uh, and operator in the Australian market that has had coal assets, have been there through that whole transformation. When you see the scale of the opportunity, how does that uh, make you feel about the Australian market, but also... Um, I guess, apprehension about what's required. Th thank you very much. It makes me feel very good, obviously, as, as an investor. It's um, uh, when, when I was uh, listening to Frank's presentation, when you see that slide, then immediately you know why this is called uh, Australia as a superpower in, in, in renewables. It's, it's just the potential is just infinite. It's, it's, and even uh, a number I, I didn't have in mind at all, that you only need 2% of the surface of the country it's, it's to, to, to reach those, those levels. So, so I think um, as an international investor, it's one of the reasons we are in Australia, because of, of the potential. And if you see those numbers, there's more than enough for every investor. It's, it's, it's just a massive scale. Sujit, do you have anything to add to that? Your, your company, Mazda, is putting its toe in the water in Australia at the moment with its first waste to energy plant, but I understand you're also exploring renewable energy investment opportunities in Australia. You are, of course, a homegrown UAE-based firm uh, which has got, I think, a footprint in 40 com countries. So I guess tell us a little bit about Australia f for you in terms of why are you in Australia? You are from the home of uh, probably the highest solar radiation on Earth. So, uh, just a bit of background. So, Mazda has been in Australia since 2019 uh, when we decided to invest alongside with Tribe uh, into the waste to energy plant that we are building in East Rockingham. Uh, since then, we've obviously also started developing several other waste to energy plants in Australia, right? Uh, one of them outside of Melbourne in Maryville and the other one outside of Sydney, right? Um, as we've progressed in the journey since 2019, we've of course formed a joint venture that has now got its headquarters in Australia in Sydney as well that looks at opportunities in waste to energy. But at the same time, uh, like you saw in the presentation, there is a tremendous opportunity available out there to be able to explore renewables in Australia, right? Uh, and the challenge is going to be, how do you then monetize that opportunity to be able to move the electron, which today you can't move, but you can move it in other forms, whether it's ammonia, whether it's hydrogen, or whether it's steel. How do you then move that renewable resource as a product across the world? Now, obviously, the most obvious market that you see today is Southeast Asia and East Asia. That's the closest by proximity, all of which are countries that are challenged from land availability. But Australia has the land. We know what it takes to do it. 2% of the land could give you that much capacity to be able to produce resources which will help to grant at least these countries the opportunity to grow. So when we look at Australia today, Waste to energy, yes, we are there, building our first plant, developing two others that we will start common construction of within the next two years to three years as well. But we also look at renewables and say what other opportunities are there in the wind space and the solar space. Monique, I'm going to come to you. You have been at Australia's Green Bank, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, since its inception, I think in 2013, is that right? 10 years at the, at the helm and Chief Investment Officer. So you have overseen a, a wide swathe of uh, renewable energy investments at, over that time. Can you tell us a little bit about the journey that Australia's been on so far? Because uh, this, we don't get to, you don't go from zero to hero um, overnight. It starts with the decarbonisation of our own electricity sector and you've been at the fore of that. Give us a bit of a sense of what that journey has looked like and where, is, where Australia is at now in terms of its, its shift to renewables, which is the basis for where we're going. Absolutely. Thanks, Anna. Um, I think I've, I've been in the industry since back in 2002 um, and it is incredible how much 
um, transition has happened in that time. So I was at Snowy to Power Station. They have a tourist infrastructure there and they have a model of the national electricity market from 2002 and it has zero renewables. And I remember back in the day when um, uh, when we, we made a, co a commitment to 30% 30, 30 renewables by 2030 and it, industry was saying, you know, the lights will go off, it's, um, you know, it's never going to be possible, there's not enough cranes in the, in the world to deliver that amount of renewables. And sure enough, we've well and truly overshot that. So um, the, it's, it's inspiring to hear that Mazda is thinking about coming into the country. My very first wind farm was um, with Macquarie alongside Mazda back in the day um, in, in China. And, and also the, the scale at which China is evolving is just absolutely incredible. So Australia is, um, we ha we're very land rich. We are moving from a, a fleet of aging fuel, aging coal-fired power stations which will die. They, they are getting old, they will die. Doesn't matter what your philosophy on climate change is or, or renewables and, and they need to be replaced. And so what will replace them is a combination of renewables and storage. Um, we estimate that uh, there's 120 billion Australian dollars needed to, to decarbonise the grid. So that's, that's build the renewables and the transmission. Uh, we have a balance sheet of 30 billion to, to try and help in that, but we will need the rest of the community to come along. And it's important to, although I'm optimistic about it, to, to not understate the challenges. So we have 10,000 kilometres of transmission line that need to be built out. There's a social licence aspect to that. Um, there's also, that, that is less than 1% of the transmission that needs to be built out globally in that same period. So we are, we are in a queue with many, under, many other countries who are undergoing that transition. But Australia really has been on the cutting edge because we have, though we have a lot of land, we also have power we need to get out to remote regions. We have a very complex grid and we are right at the cusp of how, how from an engineering challenge, you get to balance the um, high penetration of renewables, including on our rooftop, which has been a massive success in Australia, but, but how you balance that with the need to maintain grid at a very specific frequency. So. And the aspiration is to get to 82% by 2030, yeah. so 82% renewables on the main grid of Australia by 2030, which is yeah. six, six to seven years ago away, yeah. depending on whether you want to count all of 2030, which would give us another I year. I think, I think we're going to need to. Um, but that's pretty exciting. What are some of the things that are happening in, in, in Australia, Anna, in terms of the, the investments that we're seeing? Obviously, we're seeing a lot of VRE, a lot of yeah. variable renewables, wind and, and solar. Can you give us a bit of a sense of other sort of complementary technologies that you're seeing? Absolutely. And I think just first pausing to celebrate where we've got to, because we need some optimism. I mean, at a COP, we're really confronted with the sad reality of the climate deterioration. And there's so much hope embodied in what we're talking about here today. Uh, the Australian grid is currently running at uh, pretty close to 40% renewables in a volumetric term. Um, and it's a really interesting uh, set of achievements because there's been massive deployment of large-scale renewable energy. Um, there's, a, there's about uh, 28 gigawatts of utility-scale renewable energy in the power system, but there's also very close to 20, uh, 20 gigawatts of rooftop solar, um, which is uh, really transforming World the opportunity. Yeah, really transforming the opportunities and interactions with households and, and businesses. And uh, as much as um, we're here to talk about the opportunity to uh, introduce renewable electricity to power and decarbonise the uh, extraction and processing of our minerals sector and create an export industry around those really quickly. As much as we can talk about um, the opportunity around critical minerals to supply other jurisdictions with the critical resources they need for their infrastructure. There's also huge economic opportunity in decarbonising our core grid and uh, by showing with really deep credibility, the decarbonisation of uh, the Australian economy by creating the skills and a modest uh, domestic market for uh, complementary technologies, whether they be um, uh, the, the uh, distribution of batteries, the introduction of uh, virtual power plants, 
uh, hopefully more and more deployment of things like heat pump hot water and controllable devices, massive rollout of utility scale batteries to complement the large growth in utility scale uh, renewable assets that I described. But with each of those rollouts, we're seeing this growth in skills and the world is watching how we deal with that high renewable penetration. We've got a lot to share from that experience. Yes, I, look, I couldn't agree more. We've come a long way. In about six years, I think we've gone from 15% to almost 40% renewables, and it's been a big journey, and, and we're looking to double that again in the next six years. Um, let's move now to the superpower opportunity. Obviously, that lays an excellent foundation, that journey that we've, we've been on and we're still going through. Uh, but in terms of um, the superpower opportunity, hydrogen really is at the, at the fore of that, and I would acknowledge that all three of your firms... NG, Pollination and Mazda, I think, um, are looking at hydrogen opportunities in Australia. Um, Rick, you, I guess, uh, NG has really been one of the first firms in Australia to, to build large-scale hydrogen. We, we've got a green ammonia uh, plant under development together with Yara in the Pilbara. Tell us a little bit about about that and your belief in hydrogen in Australia and why you think it's um, so compelling. Yeah. Indeed, and, and uh, NG, NG as a global company um, is, is very much looking into, into that potential. And the, the only um, plant or project that we have under the construction worldwide is in the Pilbara in, in uh, Western Australia. And it's exactly an, an example of what, uh, what Frank was, um, was presenting earlier on. So um, it's a pilot project for us, a 10 megawatt electrolyzer, 18 megawatt solar and 8 megawatt uh, battery to produce green ammonia for, for Yara, who is the, um, who is the off taker. Um, and, and of course, um, a, a number of elements uh, for us were very um, important, um, uh, political and, and uh, legal, legal stability of, of the country, the resources, of course, but also being able to do a first uh, project just next to, and it's even on the site of the client, uh, so that you don't have high transport costs of that, uh, that ammonia, which, which will come uh, going, going forward. So for us, it's, it's really to, to showcase that it, it can be done. And the aim is, is of course, uh, uh, if, if, if we, we, when we complete this uh, successfully, is to ramp up and, and to go to, to bigger, bigger scale um, uh, opportunities. And, and again, Australia, uh, uh, accessibility through ports, uh, potentially huge offtake market with uh, Southeast uh, Asia. All those elements have really uh, contributed to, to doing the project uh, over there. Uh, which is a challenging part of the country. It's, uh, if you talk about uh, skills, labor, labor force, etc., it's, it's quite, um, quite remote. Uh, but it's, it's really, uh, it shows that, that we really believe in the country that uh, for our first project uh, worldwide, we have chosen uh, to do that in Australia. Anna and Sujit, we, we heard from Frank about, you know, if Australia replaced all its, uh, a number of its existing fossil fuel resource um, exports with uh, green energy exports, the, the immense potential that there would be. I guess I'm interested, Rick's currently got a green ammonia plant um, under development. The question I have is, I guess, what are, look, what are looking like the most prospective green energy export opportunities for Australia uh, based on where we're at now? What do we see coming forward? So I guess, and, and I'll try to put a perspective on this, it's slightly different, right? Um, green hydrogen, green ammonia, that's the first step, correct? But I think what we saw earlier was that and we've got to be cognizant. Green hydrogen, green ammonia is an industry that's still in its infancy. Okay? Uh, while we get there, there's other forms of renewable energy that Australia is abundantly blessed with today that can be used to be able to develop, process, resources that the rest of the world requires. And they can capitalize on them. So yes, green hydrogen, green ammonia eventually is what you're solving for because that allows you to export that green molecule. 
But while you're getting there, you can still use the abundant resources that you have as Australia to go into other areas of minerals, other areas of resources to meet global demand in a sustainable manner. That's where I would look at it, right? So when you look at mining, uh, when you look at processing of metals and minerals, that's where you want to focus on in the short term. So minerals processing is a major opportunity for Australia. Yes. Not necessarily for green value added, but just for processing, using that power, that green power for Using the green energy to process it. So what we talked about earlier about green steel, green iron, exactly that area. I completely agree, including for uh, aluminium. Um, uh, for copper, you know, copper is just central to the uh, renewable energy transition. Australia's got great deposits. Um, there's a lot of uh, development that can be quite quickly decarbonised through the deployment of renewable energy, not necessarily constrained by the build-out of transmission and some of the things that, are, that involve more complex planning, but the decarbonisation of extractive industries, processing and refining, huge opportunity. And with ammonia, not necessarily uh, all for export. There's a tremendous use of ammonia for fertiliser domestically. So even decarbonising the use of uh, ammonia for that purpose um, is, is important. Rick, just last word on that in terms of, uh, in terms of markets. Obviously, you've got, you've got green ammonia. Is that... Do you think it's a for, at the forefront of uh, potential products for development from Australia, particularly in light of uh, the shipping industry's decarbonisation? What, what do you think is shaping up as the most prospective renewable fuels? Yeah, well, I, I think indeed, and, and you're absolutely right, it's, it's in, in its infancy uh, still. And for it to really take off, we, we will need to see something similar as we have seen in the, the cost of solar panels. Uh, if you look um, uh, 30 years ago, cost of production and today, that, that's that's total, total different ballgame. And so that that will absolutely be needed to, to get there. But we're still, still a little bit uh, away from that. Um, I, I believe that the first, let's say, consumption will be more local. And then, uh, as the, the industry, uh, industry matures, uh, that will be, be more export markets. And especially markets like, like you have some um, uh, specific uh, um, uh, countries or economies in the world who, who will uh, hugely depend. For example, Singapore is a, is a good example. They don't have the space or the capacity to produce uh, their own um, renewable power through wind or, or, or solar. So, so that kind of, of, of countries, I, I think, will be a forefront on, on importing or being interested in, in importing uh, green, green fuels. Fantastic. Now, Monique, we've obviously got our work cut out for ourselves in the next six years, and we uh, know that global competition in terms of uh, the race to net zero is heating up. I've certainly felt that over the last couple of years. I'm sure that you have, that being the person who's sitting behind transactions. Um, we're, we're in a... We all know that we need to be competitive from a point of view for capital, but also for supply chains and people. How, how, what sort of policies are we seeing being put in place in Australia at the moment in terms of making sure that we can, I guess, and obviously I don't want to make you a spokesperson for the Australian government because I know uh, you are separate from them, but I guess in terms of the preparation work that we're seeing starting to go on now to make sure that we're actually in a good position to be able to take, opportunity, take advantage of this opportunity. Absolutely. Thanks, Anna. And I think um, certainly you would have felt it as well in the last year. It's just been um, policy after policy of really supportive um, infrastructure to set up for the, the next shift into renewables and, and hydrogen. So I think most, uh, most recently a couple of policies that have been touched on briefly, but the, uh, the Hydrogen Head Start program um, initially to, to fill that gap that we've been talking about. Um, ARENA and CFC sort of jointly proposed to the government a little while ago this concept that, that the missing piece is the revenue um, um, for, these, for these hydrogen projects. And so that is a capacity um, a contract for difference scheme for $2 billion, which should unlock some really meaningful size hydrogen projects. And um, what we hope is that out of that experience and the experience that's going around globally, that we do see cost reductions in the electrolyzer and, and or flexibility in, in the hours of operation for electrolyzer to be able to mop up the, 
particularly the solar resource that we have in Australia because we do have a lot of wasted um, solar resource that's generated during the day. I think the other program that's worth mentioning is the ex expansion of the, um, the capacity investment scheme, which is a really meaningful milestone in Australia. Most other economies have been driven by government revenue support for the renewable side. We've, we've always had a markets-based approach, so this is a, a new scheme that should is designed to unlock a new nine gigawatts in dispatchable storage and uh, 23 gigawatts in, in renewables. And again, it's a support on the revenue side. And, and what that does is it adds to the attractive investment environment for Australia with political certainty, but it overlays uh, a, a revenue um, soul to, to the problem of, of how you generate that much renewables. And what, that, what we hope is that should drive in then low cost of capital investors, um, large balance sheets investors into the Australian. And, and particularly, we, we hope that it might unlock some of the Australian superannuation capital that has been um, less slow to invest in Australia than, than perhaps some offshore companies that we've seen inbound interest from. And, and the reason for that is they've perceived that they can get a higher return for the same risk in, in other jurisdictions. So it's, it's felt like a shame to have all of that capital investing in renewables offshore when we would like to see it coming in. And we hope that the, the suite of policies that will be coming into effect in, in the coming years will really put us on a, a more equal playing field with, with other major effectively competitors in this supply chain constrained market. It's a very ambitious time frame. So that policy, the expanded capacity investment scheme, is to bring forward 32 gigawatts, uh, 23 gigawatts of VRE, variable renewables, wind and solar, and nine gigawatts of storage with all of the contracts awarded by the end of 2027, which is a f formidable amount of, of new power. So that's going to, I think, have a transformative um, effect on the market when we see that come forward. And it's really exciting when I think about it as somebody who's worked on climate change issues for a, a very long time, thinking that I will live in a country where the vast majority of power will be supplied by the renewable energy sector. I think that's extremely exciting. Anna? It's super exciting. And it's on a backdrop where the uh, East Coast grid, which is a, our largest grid and supplies something like 80% of the nation, for the last five years, it's been decarbonising at around 6% a year. So, you know, that moving even faster is just a phenomenal opportunity. Anna, I'm going to stay with you for one last question and then we might throw to the audience to see if there's any questions from the floor. Um, you have got a very interesting project at Pollination, which I find it interesting because you are a consulting firm but you've also got investments of your own and you've initiated a major hydrogen project called the East Kimberley Clean Energy Project, which is in partnership with traditional owners... Uh, can you just tell us a little bit about that project and what the genesis Absolutely. of it was and, and the structure that you've taken for that? Yeah, so responding to what we see in the opportunity, you know, Frank Yotso was describing 160,000 square kilometres of development that could be uh, utilised to reach the sort of potential that we see. All of that land, uh, the development of that land, it, we need new models of working that will collaborate in partnership with First Nations Australians um, so that we have a very long-term perspective on uh, the operation of those assets and so that we build equity for First Nations Australians that in some parts of Australia have low um, equity in, in the earnings of, of development projects. Um, so this, this project uh, is um, uh, created and managed under a new business uh, called the Aboriginal Clean Energy Corporation. There's www.aboriginalcleanenergy.com if you want more information. Uh, it is uh, four, four equal uh, mem partner roles in that. Uh, there's obviously Pollination Group and my colleagues have been working very hard on it. Um, but there's MG Corporation near, uh, with lands, uh, freehold lands near Kununurra. There's Balangara Ventures uh, and you might see Sissy Gore-Birch wa walking around and can ask her more about her experience of the partnership. Um, and the Kimberley Land Council. Um, the project's quite interesting because... Uh, it's, it's ambitious, it involves the construction of a 900 kilowatt uh, solar array, which would be Australia's largest, and the construction of... Sorry, how big was that? 900? 
at 900,000 uh, kilowatts. Um, and uh, it would be um, produce, uh, sorry, not yet, 900 megawatts, sorry, <laughs> um, and a 50,000 tonne per year hydrogen electrolyzer. Um, but the, uh, the, the solar array would be firmed from an existing uh, pumped hydro facility the, at, on the Ord River. Um, that or the Ord Hydro Facility at Lake Igar, Lake Igar, and the green hydrogen would then be uh, piped around 120 kilometres towards the uh, town of Wyndham, where there would be electricity from the 900 megawatt and um, the solar plus the pumped hydro to convert it into renewable ammonia. Um, that can then be exported or used locally. So it's the combination of existing water, um, it's the existing pumped hydro and it's the existing port that are quite compelling ingredients in that project. But from the uh, shareholders' perspective, the four uh, participants, um, we have a really integrated development and co-design process that's instrumental in getting um, heritage, native title, environmental uh, engineering planning all orchestrated jointly and up front, which has great uh, time-saving benefits, great quality of outcome, great buy-in, and it means really deep consideration of uh, some of the cultural heritage, social engagement and long-term operation considerations. So it's co-ownership yeah. with the First Nations people of this project. Yes. Uh, is this quite... Unusual. Uh, uh, there, there to aren't many. To my knowledge, it's the only example, and we are uh, very hopeful that others will observe and replicate, um, and find ways to bring projects forward in that way that build equity. Very exciting. Um, what we might do is open up to the floor now to see if there are any questions. We do have one from Sweden in the third row. Thank you so much. I am uh, Stefan Håkansson from uh, GFG Alliance. I'm very excited about uh, making Australia the superpower. The challenge is not actually getting new electrons into the system, it's, uh, it's getting it stable. Um, one Thursday, three weeks ago, there were 10,000 Aussie dollars per megawatt hour. And then uh, three weeks later, actually three weeks earlier, it was negative prices. Uh, heavy bait industry like steel industry is not surviving in that environment. So wh what are the business models Master and Onji is seeing bringing into the Australian business, making sure this is not an obstacle to make Australia a superpower? Would you like to take that one, Rick? <coughs> Thanks a lot and a, a very fair um, uh, observation. And um, it's, it's um, an illustration of... of one of our business models that we, we have now, we are um, we, uh, rehabilitating an old mine site, uh, Hazelwood, where we've built a 150 megawatt um, a battery. And what we try to do with that battery is, of course, uh, your battery helps to stabilize the grid, but you try to capture those negative prices to charge it and positive to discharge. But that's, of course, optimization of one, one asset. Yeah? Now, now, what we see is you have those uh, um, uh, price spikes uh, in or volatility in, in the system, but most of the time, uh, there are some, some excess exceptions, they, they don't last very long. They're, they're a limited um, uh, uh, period of time. However, what we fear a little bit is that what is called a, a bit the messy transition is, is while um, you, you, you retire coal, which is now the, the technology that's still uh, giving a lot of stability to, to the grid, of course, and you replace that with intermittent renewables, and, and there will be a period where those price volatilities will be more, um, let's say, more pronounced or more, more frequent. And I think there, um, what, what needs to be done, and with the capacity investment scheme, I think that's a very good um, step forward, is to build up your, your dispatchable, uh, renewable energy, meaning your batteries or, or your um, uh, pumped, pumped storage. And, and that really needs to be built up very quickly in order to avoid that. But 
I'm sure there will be some, some periods of, of high volatility in, in, that, uh, in that transition. Anything to add, Sushit? So I'll just add to that, right? Like, like Rick just said, right? Price volatility in a system is caused by two things. One is trading habits of the traders who are trading in the system. And the second is the inability of supply to meet demand. Correct? And that's what we are seeing today as you transition away from coal, which is the inability of clean supply to meet demand. Australia is spending a significant amount of money on enhancing its grid. Because what we have seen in the past is curtailment in the solar fields, in the wind fields. And that curtailment is happening because power that's generating from clean sources is unable to move to meet demand. As they enhance the grid, you'll find that the price volatility <coughs> barring the traders will start stabilizing towards an LRMC or Lanwa marginal cost, that's more stable. That's where it will evolve to. Anna, Anna wants to add something really quickly, thank you. They're, we're pulling on all the levers. There are a lot of different ways to influence that, that volatility. Um, there are uh, renewable assets that have very different load profiles and different parts of the, um, the nation and the, the ecology. Um, there are deep storage technologies. There are um, a range of different options behind the meter in the usage case as well. So um, I was really interested to see in the uh, announcement of the Global Renewables and Energy Efficiency Pledge the inclusion of energy efficiency targets on the demand part. So there's so many different ways that over time we can get much more uh, for, uh, forward thinking about how we respond. Yeah, it's interesting. I heard a battery, um, or a proponent of batteries talking about the, um, the, the strong business case for batteries when you have quite high volatility, but obviously it's not great for those that are uh, uh, um, energy users that need a stable stable supply. Tenant Reid, I see you loitering in the back from the Australian Industry Group. You're over to you. Thank you. Um, thinking about potentially expanding our energy system by 27 times, we're currently having a certain amount of angst about replacing one times our energy system. Uh, a big barrier to that is social licence. What do you think are the most promising approaches to that problem? And is it, well, once once we get anywhere near the 27, we, we won't get near there without having solved the one, and so it'll just be plain sailing for the mega, mega facilities, or what? Anna, I'm going to come to you last, because I think you've already had the first word. Let's hear from Rick. <laughs> Indeed, I would say in, um, in, in the sector, and it's, it's not just us, um, when we're developing new uh, projects, the, the three big challenges is grid connection permitting and the social, social license. And um, uh, I think there what we try to do, on, uh, to, to answer your, your question specifically, is to start really very upfront with engaging with communities, with explaining, with like, like in, the, in the, what, what doesn't work is that you develop your entire project uh, from behind your desk and then when you're ready to go and, and build it or, or to, to have, have your permitting done, then you, you, you arrive in the community and you say, look what a fantastic project uh, I have here. That, that really doesn't work. You, you, from the uh, inception, you have to start um, uh, engaging with, with community and, and trying to, to, um, to get buy-in. And we, we see, really see that difference in, in different projects that we have, where, where we are capable of doing a better job on that, the, the, the rest goes much, much uh, smoother. If you don't get it right, the project is going to be a nightmare until the end. I agree. Monique. I'm interested to know how do you take that into account, the social licence of a project when you decide what to, what to support and what not to support? How, how does that figure into your thinking now and are you looking more deeply at what projects are doing on that front? Thanks, Anna. Yeah, so um, the ESG aspects with, of which social licence is a key one is front of mind for not only us, but in the last year it's really front of mind for all private sector banks as well. Um, I think um, we've had a lot of good news stories coming out of our incumbent portfolio, including a lot of um, endorsement from the farmers that, we've, that have um, leased us their land to build solar farms. 
got one one farmer particularly in, in Dubbo that's been grazing sheep, co-grazing sheep with the solar panels and what he's found is that wool yields have increased. Tom Warren. Yep. <laughs> wool, yield, wool yields have increased because the, uh, the solar panels create these beautiful rows of condensation dripping off and they're just nice, neat rows of grass for the sheep and it's sort of drought-proofed his property in a way. And, and what we're finding from, from other farmers who have um, hosted renewables infrastructure on their farms is that it is a way that they feel that it's drought-proofing their family farms and their family legacy. So, so it's a reliable income stream for them come, come good crops, come bad crops. And, and particularly, there's a developer farmer we work with that, that she feels that it's, it's um, allowing her to keep the farm through generations and generations, even when the immediate um, children might not be interested in farming, that underlying revenue stream um, is, is really meaningful, particularly with the amount of uncertainty that comes with farming. So I think what we're finding is that farmers like that are kind of selling the idea to each other. Um, once, they, once they've got used to having hosting these assets, but it's not to understate the, the social license challenge of particularly rolling out 10,000 kilometres of transmission line through, um, through communities that haven't yet hosted that. So, so I agree entirely that, that how that's managed is, is really, really critical for the transition. We've, we've never done such an enormous infrastructure build in an era where everybody has a Facebook account and everybody's a journalist, you know? So it's, it's a really different era to, to build that and it has to be managed incredibly sensitively. It's got to be entrenched really, doesn't it, in, in um, genuine partnerships with communities. And that's really what you were talking about too before, Anna, with your sort of, um, I guess, equity um, model that you've got with your First Nations communities. But this sense of a genuine partnership with communities and communities can sense when that is not the case and call it out. And so, look, I think this has got to drive us to be our best tenant. We, we do not hit these targets unless we are at our best and we need to, to pull all of those learnings um, over the course of the last 10 years about how we can make sure that... Um, I think to use the words of the treasurer, Jim Chalmers, that uh, communities can be the beneficiaries and not the victims of the transition and that's really the test for industry. Any final questions? before we wrap up? None? Well, would you please join me in thanking all of our speakers today. Frank Yotso, thank you for your opening remarks. Monique Miller, Rick de Buzavi, Anna Hancock and Suji Paha. Please, uh, thank you so much for coming and attending today. It's been wonderful to have your company and please stay around for a chat. <laughs>